Hello everyone, this is Gautami. Welcome to another episode of The World Bus, where you get to hear real talk from real people. And today our guest is Ed Edison. He's just not a professor, he's a serial entrepreneur as well as an author. There's so much of experience and stories to tell, so I can't wait to welcome him. So, thank you for being our guest. You're welcome. Your profile is very exciting for me. It's a beautiful intersection of entrepreneurship, professor and an author. So how did this thing come up from? Where did it start? Well, that's a very good question. I've, uh, I, I began my, my career studying electrical engineering. And I uh, did a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at Virginia Tech and mm -hmm. master's at Johns Hopkins. And after that, I went to work for Westinghouse, which is a company that really doesn't exist anymore. It, uh, it got bought out by CBS. Oh. And uh, over the years, but I, I worked there for a while, uh, and while I was working at Westinghouse, I began doing part-time teaching, it uh, mostly in the evenings because I was working okay. during the day. Right. Started out in a community college and then went to teach at Johns Hopkins later. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the mid '80s, I got uh, a a sabbatical year to MIT that was paid for by a trust fund that they had. So I was one of the recipients. Oh. So I went, wasn't degree focused, it was go back to school and study something of interest to you and the company, whatever. So I focused on artificial intelligence. But mm -hmm. uh, one of the things about getting immersed in the community in MIT is that they just uh, there's just a culture there. Right. A culture of creativity and innovation and there's almost an attitude that if you merely take a job, you're not successful, you need to go start a company. Well, mm. that, not totally true, but, uh, yeah. but th that seemed to be the spirit. Uh, so after working in industry, I, I, I worked in industry about a dozen years across three different companies. Uh, I decided to uh, become an entrepreneur uh, the last job I had before doing that, I was the director of artificial intelligence at Booz Allen. Um, and while I was doing that, I was teaching uh, AI at Johns Hopkins and ran into a very smart programmer, and he and I decided to go into business together. Mm -hmm. And in 1990, we started a company called Conquest. Oh. And Conquest is Conquest Software. Conquest was an acronym that stood for Concept Questioning. So we were applying natural language processing to search engines. Uh, we were kind of like Google before Google, mm -hmm. uh, but before the internet. So, oh. you know, we, we didn't ride the big wave. We, we did successfully sell that company. Uh, the company did get a lot of awards. We got a product of the year award. We got a national fast 500. We uh, uh, both got entrepreneur of the year one year by Information Industry Association. So all that went on, we got a successful exit. We sold to a public company on NASDAQ. It was Excalibur Technologies at the time, who became Convera. The search engine got bought out by Fast Search and Technology. Mm. That got bought out by Microsoft. So the product that we developed is owned by Microsoft now, but it's not in use because it's rather outdated at this point in time. Uh, but that experience, I went through everything from selling to raising capital to uh, getting SBIR grants and uh, learn the, the ropes as an entrepreneur. And I continued part-time teaching mm -hmm. to sort of balance the feast or famine life of an entrepreneur. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you start a company, you don't get paid. Right. After a while, then when you start getting customers, you can start to pay yourself. And as your company grows, you can take a market rate salary and then when you sell your company, you get a lot of money all at once, and then you crash and burn and don't work for a few months, and then you're not getting paid all over again. And that cycle repeats like that, yeah. and it might not succeed. Uh, so teaching was a passion of mine that I have done my entire career, but never full-time. I won't say never full-time. I filled in for somebody on paternity leave mm -hmm. once, but otherwise uh, not not full-time. I was always heavy part-time, mm. usually teaching a couple of classes a term and staying involved with students and uh, 
starting companies at the same time. So this went on for about 25 years, this, this cycle of starting companies, building them, funding them, trying to sell them, some successfully, some not. Uh, and, and I was uh, teaching during that time. I wrote the book that I did 20 years ago, right. uh, Leveraging the Horizon. It's really outdated right now. It's still available on Amazon for about $15 paperback, but it, it, it was about entrepreneurship during the dot-com era, mm-hmm. which was in the uh, you know 90s. And yeah. business models and metrics were different then. And there's been a lot of new ideas in entrepreneurship that have come in since then. So I, I haven't gotten around to writing the second edition of that book, but I intend to do it someday, you know, maybe next year. We'll be waiting for it. <laughs> okay, I'm not working on it right now because I'm finishing a couple of other projects. Oh. But, uh, um, but anyhow, so that's, that's sort of how it started. I began as an engineer. Engineer turned entrepreneur. And now I'm you know, dipping my toe in venture capital. I'm, right. I'm involved in two venture capital funds. So. That's interesting. So mostly you and I have been an entrepreneur. And, the, and I've always been with entrepreneurs. And we always knew that you know, certainty is a very human need. And in entrepreneurship, we don't know the certainty at all. Every day is changing. And there are many times you feel to give up. Well, I've started five companies. And every one of them probably had at least five times that I should have shut it down and walked away. But I didn't. So, yes, there's a lot of uncertainty, and uh, you have to embrace uncertainty. Uh, You have to be willing to change when your original vision is determined to be wrong. Nobody gets it perfect the first time. So um, there's there's an old principle that's called, uh, in the literature, called the corridor principle. Starting a company is like walking down this long corridor and you're looking for light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Sometimes you might see a little glimmer and sometimes you might not. But along the way, there there are doors in the corridor on the left and the right side. And every once in a while, one of those doors might be open. You take a look in there and if you see something <laughs> that looks good. Yeah. To go from where you are, you know, shift right 20 degrees, uh, then you can adapt. So I, I would say adaptation. Is, is 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 important. Uh, one of the things I talk about in my book, the, the, actually the name of the book, Leveraging the Horizon, actually has a meaning. And the idea is that you start out with a vision that you're passionate about, some, what I call the horizon, some long-term vision that you can't achieve right now, but where you think the world needs to go or where you want it to go or where you want to go. And by looking at your horizon from different vantage points, you want to find that fir- that first or next step that you can take in the direction of that horizon that you can build a business about that will set you on your course to that horizon. Now, that might sound a little theoretical, so I'll give you a concrete example. So think of uh, what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX. If you listen to him in the media, he'll tell you his goal colonize Mars. Right. But that's a horizon that's way out there and he's not doing it today. What's he doing? He's shooting rockets up, putting satellites in the sky, and he's going to own the internet, Wi-Fi in the sky. And that will create huge cash flow, which will Mm -hmm. enable him to perpetuate that vision. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's just an example of the concept I'm talking about as you look for what you can do today that sets you on your course to where you would like to go because you know, it's nice to dream. Mm-hmm. If you don't have, you, you can't achieve a dream. You never realize a dream if you don't have one. Right. But you can't achieve it all at once. You know, the old saying, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. Mm-hmm. So you got to find that first bite and then keep on going and be tenacious. So back to your question, all the uncertainty. Um, one of the reasons I got into teaching, besides being passionate about it, is that it's it's not high paid, but it's steady income. Right. Whereas the entrepreneur, it could be no income or it could be high income or could come back again. Right. So that's that uncertainty. But if you add stability to uncertainty, you get a mix that hmm. maybe you can 
maybe you can live with as you go along the way. So it kind of worked for me. That's very true. And oftentimes I hear that entrepreneurship is not for everyone. It's not. Like why? I I kind of know the reason, but I really want to hear from you. Well, um, dealing with uncertainty is a very big thing. Right. Uh, people start families and they need to know how they're going to pay their mortgage and security is a big thing for people uh, if you can't find a way to do that I mean I started my first company when I had two little kids but I found a way to cover it you know I, I had a government grant I uh, had a, re a retirement account that I decided I didn't need so I liquidated it and I went out and started raising money and selling product or selling services to, to while the product was being built. And we were able to stitch that thing together one puzzle piece at a time. Mm -hmm. But that does have a lot of uncertainty. There were days when I was wondering if we were going to be here. Um, and, uh, and, and so some people can't stomach that level of uncertainty. But that's not the only thing, you know. Uh, Having a vision, not, not, you can say that ideas are a dime a dozen, but there are some people who just don't think of ideas. There's other right. people who think of ideas and can't execute them. You, the idea itself is not enough. You have to execute. So execution is everything, really. Mm -hmm. And execution is all about taking the right steps, but you have to have what I call tenacity. That means when, the tough, when it's tough out there, you keep on going. You, you don't quit when everybody else would have quit. Mm. So it really isn't for everyone. People like a comfortable life. I mean, I like that too sometimes, yeah. but but I do get antsy when I'm not doing anything. So. Right. Um, so, uh, which yeah. is rare. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's not for everyone. Um, you will also be told as an entrepreneur by people who aren't entrepreneurs that you're crazy. That you made true. dumb decisions. There's no way you're ever going to achieve that. You'll hear this over and over and over again. Don't listen to it. It isn't true. It's only true if you believe it. That's true. And the yeah. people who are saying it mm. are saying it for whatever reason. Mm. It isn't factual. It's, it's an opinion. Yeah. What's driving that opinion is that they're... Uh, is it, they get mired in their negative thinking or beliefs. I don't know, but uh, right. you you just have to learn not to listen to that. You just keep on going. You know, you don't go out there and say, "I'm going to do this." Point at your horizon. I'm doing this, um, and you get a bunch of non-believers. Instead, just go do it, and then they'll see it when you get there. You know, the media will often portray an entrepreneur as somebody who came out of nowhere and succeeded. Exactly. That's yeah. Never true. Yeah. They worked their tails off for years to get to where they got. It's just that they weren't noticed until they got somewhere. Hmm. You know, so. That's very true. The things you've done so far, the things you've achieved so far, and being an entrepreneur and a serial entrepreneur is not easy. How do you get through it? And I know it's right now you can tell like, huh, this is what I did, and this have to be strong. But for you at that particular point of time, I don't guess it was easy. Uh, well, you know, the first time was the hardest yeah. because there was the most uncertainty. Hmm. And I, I was working for Westinghouse, as I mentioned, which was a conservative organization, hierarchical management, all that stuff. Right. <laughs> and I put in my resignation. I was in middle management. And I put in my resignation notice, and we had this tough, wiry VP mm -hmm. who was sort of an authoritar authoritarian type. He would always look, pound the table and tell people to get this done, just go do it, you know, that kind of thing. When I resigned, he called me into his office and said, what are you doing? And I said, I, I got a SBIR grant and I'm going out to start a software company. He goes, you're just playing in a sandbox. And I looked at him and said, what? And he said, he said, and he, this is a quote, nobody ever leaves management at Westinghouse. That's what he said. Nobody ever leaves. It's like, what a stupid thing you're doing. That's what he told me. <laughs> you know, if I had listened to him, my life would have been a lot different. Right. Right. 
But I went out there. It wasn't easy. I did get, you know, one piece of funding after another, and I eventually came together. And uh, it just, you, you just didn't know that for sure that it was going to come together the way it should. And there were good days and bad days. Uh, but the second time around, I had a couple of things to my advantage. One is I had money in the bank from succeeding the first time. So I could afford to not be paid. Right. And the second thing I did is I was the first investor in the second company. I wrote a $400,000 check mm -hmm. and I hired eight software engineers on the first day. And, uh, and so I had people, they were getting paid. I didn't need to be paid right away. And we got off to a very fast start because of that. So that made it a little less risky. Mm -hmm. Um, a little less uncertain because we had that that starting point mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know that company got sold as well not not for as much money as the first one but I did recover what I put into it made a little bit more eventually I did get paid mm -hmm. and when I sold that company uh, I took three years off and didn't work I bought a beach property and Mm -hmm. Took my kids to the beach all summer for, for three straight years, kind of like. But I did spend time with my kids, but this gave me a chance to spend a lot more time. And they were early teenagers by then, so it uh, it was a good time. Um, and then I, I went, uh, you know, I started another company off of government funding. And after the 2008 crisis, we had tougher times, so I, I felt like I was kind of back to square one when I started the next company. Mm -hmm. But I already knew how to do it, and I had a history of doing it, so I went out and raised money from people who knew I made money before, and so it was, I was able to, uh, to raise enough capital to get that company started until it was getting money from other sources. Mm -hmm. So... There's there's a saying that you know it once you do it you keep on doing it right right uh, but and there seems to be an attitude in the venture community that if you have experience doing it you have a better shot at succeeding the next time but I find that's not really true mm -hmm. only a little bit true it's mostly you know there's a lot of luck at the draw here you, right. you do not know what that market wants until you put the product in its hands and they test it. And you tweak it and change it until you make it the way they want it. Hmm. And then and you don't really know if the market's going to accept your idea until you build it, test it. That's why they do this so-called lean startup concept yeah. now, which means get, get something out there in the hands of the customer very fast that does one thing well, that meets one of their needs, mm -hmm. and then just start adding to it and taking feedback early. Right. Um, and... It's because, you know, the sort of old school thinking was you go write a business plan, then you go execute the business plan. The sort of lean startup thinking is, well, do a pitch deck, <laughs> get a, a, an early product out there and keep updating those, those mm -hmm. documents. It's cause, because your business plan is not a roadmap, it's a compass. Right. Right. It's different. If, if you think of it as a roadmap, then you're reluctant to change it. Yeah. So I, one of the quotes that was in my book from a colleague entrepreneur that I that keeps coming back to me is that business planning is like writing in the sand. Mm. You can write words in the sand at the beach and as soon as it rains or the winds come along, it's gone. And you gotta keep writing in the sand. Keep updating that plan. You know, and that's true because mm -hmm. Again, being a compass and not a roadmap, you can see today where you think you ought to be going. But as you start moving there, the market changes or you get feedback from the market. And your idea of what you have to do to succeed changes. And you mm. have to be willing to adapt to it. If you're stubborn, it could cost you. you know, right. If you're stubborn about your first vision, you're not, you yeah. need to flex and bend. So you need to be flexible. Is the entrepreneurship journey lonely? Is it lonely? Is it lonely? <laughs> um, I never did it by myself. 
Uh, I started a company with one other person the first time. The second time, I started it with eight other people. Uh, another time, I started a company on government funding, and we had three or four people based on the contract. And uh, I've run companies from a couple of people all the way up to 100 people um, and, and back again. So yes and no. Um, it's a little different now than when I first started doing it. Because you don't need an office, right? You you can do it from home and do it virtually. So, you know, you get get onto Zoom and you're networking with three or four people who might not even be in the same state as you are, um, and trying to get things going. Um, so, you know, working at home has its mm. lonely disadvantage, but you know, yeah, I don't live alone, so. Um, uh, my wife is a little younger than I am, but she's we got so many grandchildren she's not working, so she's around a lot. So I'm not I'm not really lonely doing that. I, mm -hmm. I teach school at the same time, so I get in front of students, so that that uh gets me out of the house mm -hmm. and interacting with people and I go to meetings from time to time, does the same thing. I go to networking meetings, sometimes not virtual networking meetings, just because of right. you know. Uh but yeah, it, it, you just you don't want to start a company by yourself. I wouldn't recommend that because a company the, the the power of the idea comes from the network of the people that you're working with. It's not a one person job. One person may be the inspirer and may be the original vision, but if you don't get people surrounding you, right? And and I've always thought that the right way to do it is to get people smarter than you are around you in different disciplines like uh, most of the companies that I've started required code writing mm. and I can write code I've written code off and on throughout my career but I never focused on it full time which is what I think to be really the the, the excellent code writers are people who are doing it eight or ten hours a day for months on end they get deeply involved and I'm, I'm more the broader person who will do a little who dabble with this and that and I'll dive in and do a little bit of coding and then I'm off doing something else or raising some money over here or doing mm -hmm. so so I, I never took the time to become a, you know the world class coder that I've recognized in other people so I've always tried to get a superstar coder right. in every company I did that wasn't me and I would generate the ideas and the the concepts and other people would write the code. Mm -hmm. So I had to spend my time selling the vision and raising money and finding people and finding employees, finding investors, finding customers until it's big enough that you can bring in a sales director who would do that. Right. And that's a challenging transition because you have a lot of people who are successful in selling things in industry and they come into a startup and they can't sell. And the reason is the selling from a startup company is not like selling hotcakes in November. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it, it requires, um, a consultative sell because the product, especially in your early days is always uh, kind of mushy and it's a moving target mm -hmm. and you're trying to shape it and you want the customer's feedback to shape it. And you're trying to find use cases for where this technology can solve someone's problem. And so there's a, there's a consulting element to that kind of selling. Mm -hmm. And someone who's been very successful at, say, selling Oracle mm -hmm. could walk into a startup and sell nothing because they're used to the method that's used to sell something that's fixed in nature and you just want to sell a whole bunch of copies of it. That's very different mm -hmm. than taking something that is um, an evolving, moving developing target and finding the early customers and figuring out where the value is. Right. That's true. But probably this generation, a lot of entrepreneurs are operating, starting off alone or they might get a founder or co-founder with themselves. And there's a lot of changes with the way startups was run in back in the days. And right now there is a different set of challenges and different set of advantages. Do you find a difference or not? Well, yeah, there are some differences, I'm sure. Uh, so I 
did started my first company in 1990, and at the time, nobody had email. Right. Almost nobody had cell phones, and if it did, it was a three-pound clunker. Um, and the internet wasn't publicly available. Only professors and universities used it, and they did it from prompt lines. Mm. There was no user interface, you know. So the technology that exists today just wasn't there then. So it was almost a necessity that your team had to be in the same room together. Mm. So you needed to be in an incubator or an office somewhere. Um, and you could take some things home, but the communication just wasn't easy. Right. That's all changed. And the other thing that's changed is the interest in entrepreneurship. Right. 30 years ago, it was seen as an unusual thing to do, it was rare, especially on the East Coast. Mm. A lot of people in Silicon Valley did it, but nowhere else. Mm -hmm. Anywhere else, you were really a rare person if you did that. Um, and uh, that's no longer true. It's being pushed in the universities. Uh, uh, you know, I've been an entrepreneur and a professor for years, and I was one of the early um, professors of entrepreneurship. I, I taught an entrepreneurship class in 2001. Mm. Okay, so, and at that time, almost no universities had courses in it. It wasn't even seen as a thing to do. Now they have degrees in it. Right. Um, so uh, that has done things that are both good and bad. The right. good thing is it generates enthusiasm among students um, and it causes creativity. Uh, but the downside is it proliferates startups, especially coming, there's a lot of startups out there that shouldn't even be in business because their idea isn't big enough or strong enough to be, to be a company. Right. You know, one of the first things students think of when you say, hey, let's write a business plan, they want to do an app. But it's, it's really hard to build a business out of an app. Yeah. You know, a business has to be something much bigger than that most of the time. Um, so... Uh, Funding has gone up, but not as up as as much as the numbers of new companies there are. Mm -hmm. So many of these new companies, they just don't succeed because there's not enough funding to go around. And some of them don't succeed because, because of the openness to starting companies now. Um, young entrepreneurs are often starting companies that shouldn't be started. Right. So, there's, so that's the downside. The upside is it creates all this wonderful energy and enthusiasm among students and it causes them to go try things, which they should do. Right. You know, there's not this attitude of that failure is bad anymore. It used to be that way, mm -hmm. that you, you weren't supposed to fail. If you failed, it might hurt your career, you know, that kind of, mm -hmm. that kind of attitude is, 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 doesn't help when it comes to starting a company because you need to be open to experimentation and you need to know that more times than not, it's going to fail. That, that whatever, you know, business experiment, you've got to try something different and keep Keep trying until something works. Yeah. So the question is, right now, due to a lot of publicity over entrepreneurs, let it be Shark Tank India or the lifestyle which is being shown, or there's like a lot of a good side which is being shown, and not the exact things what people actually go through while building the company. So do you want to highlight what actually happens back down? Oh, uh, well, that's a, a big question, but um, it... It isn't usually the case that someone decides, hey, I'm going to go start a company, and then they go looking for that thing they're going to start. Yeah. Um, more it should come from a person's desire to, to solve a big problem or change the world or make a difference in the world, or they've experienced a problem in an industry they're working in that they know they can help fix, uh, and it's just not getting fixed. So it, it comes from a vision that you're passionate about. And mm -hmm. then it isn't necessarily the case that every time you have a, you think of a big important problem that you think you can solve with other people, it isn't necessarily the case that it always should be a company. Right. You might do that within a big company. Mm -hmm. You might do it within a university. Mm -hmm. You might do it on the side while you're working. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it should be a company. And it depends on just exactly what has to be done um, mm -hmm. and whether there's a market that will make a company. Uh, to build a company, 
you really only need one thing. You need a customer. Right. Right. And so if you're to have a customer, you're solving a customer's problem. And so from an entrepreneuring point of view, there's two ways to approach that. One is what I call market pull, and the other one's technology push. Hmm. Um, technology push means you're familiar with some technology and the research in the field, and some light bulb goes off in mm -hmm. the minds of you and your colleagues where you think you can build a better technology or make make a better light bulb or right. you know you can uh, do something lofty that people didn't think was doable before and now you think you know how to do it. That's right. Well, that's risky for two reasons. One, the technology may or may not work out when you go to do it. And secondly, there may or may not be a customer for it. Mm -hmm. So technology push has that additional risk is that you have to find the need that you're solving. Whereas a market pull type company is you identify a problem first and you solve that problem and then that's your customer, whoever has that problem. So whether or not that can be a business or not is a matter of figuring out if the market's big enough. Mm. So you have to ask yourself, who is the customer? It's the person with the problem. Who exactly are they? Right. And how many of them are they? Yeah. And do they have money? Mm -hmm. um, do they, can they afford to pay for the solution that they need? Um, well, they should be able to if you're delivering value. In other words, you're, you give more than you take back. The price is X, you've got to be delivering more than X in value. Otherwise, why would anybody buy it? Mm. Right, so that's a market pull type of business. So whether or not you should go into that business or not depends on how big is the market. Mm. In other words, who's the customer? How many of them are there? And then what percentage of that market can you get? And that depends on what the competition is. Mm -hmm. So there's always competition. Don't ever say you don't have competition. Right. Do a Porter's Five analysis. You'll yeah. find out maybe you don't have direct competition, mm -hmm. but there is substitute competition. Somehow that, that user or person is meeting that need in some way today. It just might be painful. Right. Okay, so... That's the competition, the way they're meeting the need today. Mm -hmm. um, if you can overcome the competition within your niche or zone, then you'll be able to get a percentage of that market. Well, mm -hmm. When you add up, when you, when you take the percentage of that market and multiply by the price mm -hmm. that you can sell that product for, that will tell you just how big of a business you can build. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, hey, I got a neat app, let's go make a business, and I say, well, who's going to pay for it and how much you're going to get for it and who's the customer, you know, how you're going to make money. People think those things are for free, you know, so you have to answer all these questions and they're really simple questions. Right. What are you going to sell to whom? Why are they going to buy it? You can't answer those three questions. You shouldn't even be thinking about going into business. Right. That's true. And there are, there are times when somebody thinks of a cool product and they don't answer those three questions. Mm -hmm. What are you going to sell? Well, you know, you know, I talked to a guy recently, told me he wanted to build a warp drive. Mm -hmm. You know what a warp drive is? It's something that's only theoretically possible in physics to build a spaceship that goes faster than light. Okay, well, that's nice that you want to build a warp drive, but who are you going to sell it to? <laughs> How many of them are there? What are they going to pay for it? How much is it going to cost you to build that thing? If you can build it. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know. That's you can be enthusiastic about technology. Yeah. It doesn't mean it should be a business. Right. Now, it seems like the further west you go, if you go out to Silicon Valley, the more aggressive they get with their ideas. <laughs> you know, how much they think something's worth and whether they think they always for over forecast. Mm. You know, they, it, 30 years ago, you, it used to be expected that you were going to go from zero to 50 million in five years. Oh. And if you weren't going from zero to 50 million in five years, then the VCs wouldn't even look at it. Mm -hmm. So people would manufacture their business plans to go from zero to 50 in five years, but it doesn't mean there was a market there to do it. Mm. Well, nowadays, if you go look at a Silicon Valley business plan, it isn't zero to 50, it's like zero to 500 right. in five years. You know, so it's, uh, you know, crazy numbers and nobody ever meets those forecasts. So do you have any final notes for the podcast? Or is it really something you want to see? 
Any, any final notes? Final notes? Oh, well, I don't know. That's a big question, a broad question. Um, don't go and start a company just to start a company or just to make money because you'll burn out. Right. You have to pursue something that you're passionate about if you're right. going to do it. That that may that you just get up every morning and it it, it just it's what you live and breathe and you're excited about it um, that because you're gonna have a high failure rate probability and you're gonna put a lot of time into it so you better enjoy it or you're not gonna you're gonna you're gonna burn out nice. you'll quit and go back to work at the first obstacle if you're not <laughs> enjoying it yeah so you don't do it for the money you don't do it. Um, just to build a company, you don't do it for your ego, <laughs> which is a, another thing that, that comes up when yeah. entrepreneurs raise money. They come in and want venture capital, but then they don't want the investor involved in their business. Mm -hmm. And what I tell entrepreneurs is when you're asking for capital, you're, you're seeking an investment partner. Right. And they're going to be involved. They're going to be on your board. And it's like a marriage mm. and you need to pick the right partner and you need to be coachable and, and be willing to work with them because that investor is not putting money in your business so you can be the CEO. Mm. They're putting money in the business to make money. And that should be your goal too. Mm -hmm. Your goal to, to achieve success. You will make money if you achieve, achieve success, but, um, and if you're on the same page with the investor, then it will work. That means that the day comes that you're not the CEO. So what? You're not the CEO anymore. You collectively decide you were the wrong person from that point forward. You know, companies change CEOs as mm -hmm. they grow right. because, because they change in their nature. They're, it's a different kind of person that can go from some, nothing to something yeah. than to go from some $2 million business to a $100 million business. One is like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. You're filling out a vision and you're putting all the pieces on the board. That's going from nothing to something. But to go from that $2 million business to a $100 million business, that's looking at the company and seeing what's producing the $2 million and just doing a whole lot more of that mm -hmm. and stop doing everything else. And that grows the business. That's a whole, that's, that's a systems oriented approach. It's taking something and multiplying it. So it, right. it's a different style of management. Yeah. Doesn't mean it has to be a different person, mm -hmm. but it usually is. It's usually someone with a different, usually those kind of people that are good systemic managers couldn't start a company. Right. And those people who start companies, they don't want to do that job. Yeah, it's boring. It, they may see it as boring. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, to go every day to do the same particular task, especially for people who have an entrepreneurship mindset, they mm. find it very less interesting. Yeah, so know who you are. Right. And where you fit. Yeah. And not everybody's an entrepreneur either. Some people want to be involved, want the excitement of a startup, but they're not an entrepreneur. So go to work for a startup. Right. You don't have to be the one who started the startup. Startups need people. They need people just like Every other company needs people. Yeah. So you, you you don't have to start the company to go to work for the company. So an entrepreneur takes a lot of risk for a lot of reward, whereas an entrepreneur takes little risk, for little financial risk. They may take career risk, but it may accelerate their career. So, for example, you could um, start a product within a company and in the beginning, it's such a small product that it's not getting a lot of attention, so you lead it. And once it succeeds, you know, you're the product manager. Maybe you've leaped over several levels of, of, of career progression by doing that. But your pay level is, and your, your wealth hasn't changed materially. But maybe, the excel, maybe you're on an accelerated path now. You also may have gotten off the mainstream path, which is... The, other, the risk the other way, particularly if you're in a company that doesn't embrace innovation. Mm. So typically engineering companies do embrace innovation. So if you work for like Siemens or Lockheed Martin, mm. then 
the idea of, you know, pursuing a product might appeal to them. Mm. Uh, you have to find the right one and get the right people behind you. Um, but whereas an entrepreneur, you know, they want to own it and start their own. That's not always the right thing to do. Because again, it boils down to size of market and also boils down to, you know, maybe you, maybe you would succeed inside a big company doing it. Mm. I mean, you can make a lot of money going up the corporate path. Mm. You don't become a billionaire, but you can become a millionaire. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's just, you know, different strokes for different folks, and it's based on the opportunity. Who's going to fund this thing? And does it even fit inside your company? So there's, there's nothing wrong with, with doing it as an entrepreneur. You know, we kind of, the media will put the small startup companies up on a pedestal, but it really shouldn't be. The failure rate is really high. Failure rate inside a company is probably not so high. It's still a failure rate, mm -hmm. but it's, it's different. It's a different risk-reward scenario. Mm -hmm.